Hi, it's The Wire, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. It is February 26, 2024. It's a Monday. Now, from time to time, people will ask me, hey, what is it about boxing that you like so much? And I keep telling them that it's because on days like today, something weird happens and it just changes the whole landscape, right? As I make this video, Saul Alvarez has decided to move on from PBC. Folks, that's huge news, right? I don't even know what's going to happen Cinco de Mayo now, right? We'll talk about that in a different video. In this video, and I thought this video was big enough. In this video, we're going to just give an update on our thoughts on Anthony Joshua against Francis Ngannou. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, you're on a basketball court. You're just learning how to play basketball. You're an athlete, but you're a football player. You can dribble with your right hand pretty good. You have a celebrity basketball game against the Los Angeles Lakers with LeBron James. Who is going to be guarding you? If you slip up, everyone is going to know as the game is televised. It has been advertised with your name attached. When it is you and LeBron who has been on several all-defensive teams and you're one-on-one, -on -one, do you try to dribble with your left hand? The hand you're not that great with, your offhand. Let's pause here for a moment. Let's go with your best estimate right now. Think to yourself, what is the percentage of right-handed new people to basketball who would try to dribble with their offhand in front of LeBron James? 20%? Perhaps lower? Now let's say you're a fighter. You decide to accept your first boxing match. You're right-handed. It is a promoted fight against the one person on the planet, some would argue, is the most dangerous person to try new things against in a ring. The reigning heavyweight champion, Tyson Fury, who happens to still be unbeaten. Do you try to switch to your offhand? Do you get into a left-handed stance during the fight to try to confuse the heavyweight champ who himself is ambidextrous. What percentage of not the general public, what percentage of professional prize fighters would do that? 20%? Perhaps lower? Who would gamble like this? Well, Francis Ngannou switched to a left-handed stance in his first boxing match against heavyweight champion Tyson Fury. Let's just say it was a wow moment. An even bigger wow moment came when he knocked down the heavyweight champion with his off hand, his left hand. Folks, this is a risk taker. This is a gambler. I was watching the show where the fighters sit across the table from each other. Anthony Joshua on one side, Francis Ngannou on the other side. Some guy asking both of them questions, trying to keep everything friendly and civil. Now Anthony Joshua, who was keeping it friendly and civil, 
Anthony Joshua said his goal was to once again be the heavyweight champion. Now, Francis Ngannou was interesting. Right? He was interesting to me. Now, understand, I have a side hobby where I also make true crime videos. And I'm fascinated by people who have the wrong affect. Right? The person saying hard lines, but yet the person has a face, has mannerisms that hide the hardness of the lines being said. Now, while his affect was friendly, Francis Ngannou's response was confrontational. Right? Now, I already know he's a gambler. Right? Like many of you, I saw the Fury fight. I know he's a gambler, whatever he says here. But here, he drops content that's combative while looking grateful for the fight. He looks across at Joshua, and he, in a very friendly, I would argue, rehearsed manner, tells Joshua that he wanted to fight him. He asked for the fight, he says. He even goes further and says, it's not about the titles for me. He then gets biographical and says, not favorably to himself, he says that he only has a couple of years left. And he wants to fight, as he puts it, the top three boxers. Now, let's pause for a moment. Right? I'm just John Q. fan watching this. And I'm thinking the top three boxers, he's already faced Fury. I'm guessing that's one down. Now he wants to face Joshua. <laughs> right? The question is, who's the third? Is it Usyk? It certainly will be if Usyk beats Joshua. Or is it the winner of Zhili Zhang versus Joe Parker? Or is it my heir apparent, Philippe Bergovic? Right? And Ganu doesn't say, but he's already said enough. Joshua's part of a plan for him. He's not even interested in the title. He wants this fight. Right? To me, it was clear he believes he can beat AJ. Let me go one step further. Every time I look at Joshua, I'm struck by his size. Right? Joshua is a big man. I'm also struck by how Joshua always keeps himself in shape. So here is Joshua, a big man. While I bet on MMA, I'm really a boxing guy. I'm not an MMA person. Right? So I see Joshua and he has the thick neck. Or at least from my perspective as a boxing fan what a thick boxing neck looks like. But then the camera moves over to Nganu, who is wearing loose clothing. It's as if he's taking a page out of the Barry Bonds playbook. If you remember when Barry was hitting 73 home runs. Nganu's wearing loose clothing. But the one thing he can't hide is his neck. And here I am looking at Joshua's neck. Then I look at Nganu's neck. Nganu's neck looks like a redwood tree. Nganu's neck looks much bigger than Joshua's neck. I believe if you track weights, you'll see that Nganu entered the ring against Tyson Fury with very little body fat on him, but yet he weighed over 270 pounds. This is a big man. So, let's cut to the chase. I think Anthony Joshua wins the fight by KO in the middle rounds. But you, as a gambler, should be disturbed. Right? You're getting much shorter odds on Nganu than you did the Dominique Brazil fight, where Brazil went off at something around 10 to 1 against AJ. You're getting much shorter odds on Nganu 
Again, this is his second fight. Folks, he's 0-1. Believe it or not, you're getting shorter rods on Nganu. Then you got on former Olympic gold medalist, former heavyweight champion, Alexander Povetkin. Go back and look at the odds for that fight. They were greater than 5-1. to one. So you're a gambler. Gambler, let me ask you a question. Why are you only getting a plus 355 here on Francis Ngannou, who has yet to officially win a professional boxing match? Now let's talk about a few things. Again, I believe the most likely outcome, and the bet I'm going to suggest is dangerous, the most likely outcome is AJ by stoppage. Right? AJ, by the way, has a very high KO ratio. Most of AJ's fights end with AJ by stoppage. Right? But... Ngannou's ability to fight left-handed will help him neutralize AJ's jab, won't it? Right? You saw AJ throwing some great jabs to Otto Wallen's body. Right? Wallen, of course, is a lefty. But Wallen doesn't punch anything like Francis Ngannou punches. Right? I talk to some MMA, excuse me, I talk to some MMA people from time to time. You'll see their comments here online, right, in the comment section of these videos. They firmly believe, and I mean firmly believe, that nobody on the planet punches as hard as Francis Ngannou. Right, again, he drops the heavyweight champ with his left. We didn't see the big eye-opening right hand in that Fury fight. Maybe we see it here. Right? Let me just say this too. Because Nganu can go southpaw, because he's ambidextrous and can change the angles, and because AJ, like Razor Ruddick against Lennox Lewis, because AJ, when he bends down to hit you with a jab to your midsection, leaves his head exposed. In other words, think about it. You have a left jab, you bend down, you're hitting the guy with the left jab. What's protecting you over here up top as you throw the punch? Not much. Right? And Ganu could look at that film, could try to set it up, could try to pretend that he's Otto Wallen. Only he could have a right hand ready for that moment. Understand, if AJ is low, throwing a jab to Nganu's body, Nganu has a shot with his right hand if he can get the timing. Kenny, in his second professional boxing match, let's just say, as Tyson Fury learned firsthand, you don't want to get hit in the head by this man. Another thought. The fight is only 10 rounds. It is not a 12-round fight. I thought, and I know two of the three judges disagree with me. I thought Nganu faded in the 9th and 10th rounds. Two of the three judges gave the 10th round to Nganu. Let's remember the bullet that boxing just avoided. Look at the scoring of the Tyson Fury and Ganu fight. Folks, Fury couldn't even win a unanimous decision there. It was razor close. Boxing came this close to having an MMA guy beat the top position in the sport, the heavyweight champion. Now, here, 10-round fight. That Tyson Fury fight, I would argue, Nganu started faster than Tyson Fury. Right? What rounds did Nganu win in that first fight? I think it was really the early to mid rounds. By the end of the third round, he's knocked down Tyson Fury. 
By contrast, AJ, heavy puncher, heavy puncher, but a cautious starter. You heard me mention Dominique Brazil. He ends up stopping Brazil, but Brazil has some moments early in that fight. You heard me mention Alexander Povetkin. He ends up stopping Povetkin, but Povetkin has some moments early in that fight. Right? You might recall him knocking down former champion Vladimir Klitschko. Vladimir Klitschko gets off the canvas, has some moments against AJ, doesn't he? AJ knocks down Andy Ruiz. Ruiz gets off the canvas. Not only has some moments against AJ, he knocks down AJ multiple times, takes his title. Right? AJ is not George Foreman. Right? AJ is not from the school of thought that you don't wait on a boxer. Right? He's not the big slugger who comes in and says, okay, look, I'm here to trade. This is not Jerry Cooney. Right? Punchers firmly believe that if there's a shootout, they win. That the last thing they want to do is to start reading your feints. To start having you hint at stuff. They feel it's a wasted round if they aren't throwing hard punches. That's not who AJ is. Right? AJ sees himself as a counterpuncher. You notice his fights tend to go a few rounds. That Jermaine Franklin fight. And this is a fighter with a heavy knockout percentage, AJ. That Jermaine Franklin fight goes the distance, doesn't it? That's after the Usyk fight goes the distance. The second Usyk fight. First one did too. Robert Hellenius just fought. You know, George Foreman would have come across the ring on Hellenius. Now, Hellenius is one of the hardest punchers in boxing. Right? But I'm telling you, folks with a slugger's mindset would say, this guy just fought, what, last week? I'm going to catch him while he's tired. I'm going to let the guy know he has to work this fight. Not AJ. Doesn't Hellenius make it to the seventh round of that fight? Right? AJ is a guy who likes to see you. Isn't he? He likes to read you. Doesn't he? I've looked at some AJ interviews. His thoughts on trainers. Now he's effusive with Ben Davidson. He talks about how Ben lets him be himself. Right? Let's remember. Robert Garcia wanted him to bend his knees a little bit to be more aggressive against Usyk. With Derrick James, you could tell there was an emphasis on keeping your hands up, on defense. Right? AJ wants to move around the ring. AJ wants to be free. He doesn't want to be in his 30s thinking about some strategy of Okay, how do I defend myself in this situation? He wants it to flow a little bit freer than that. But when you look at his fights, what that means is AJ spends some early rounds looking at guys, being cautious. There was a fight I thought AJ was going to lose. I still own that fight. Right? I'm not trying to run from it. It's the Kubrat Pulev fight. Right? Just understand, AJ comes out it's a demolition. I was on the Pulev side of that play. AJ drops him hard. Pulev turns away from AJ. If you're a Pulev better, as I was, you thought, oh, this is a total disaster. Then something interesting happened. Suddenly, AJ lets Pulev back into the fight. 
right? AJ, who has Pulev as bad off as you can be in the third round, somehow allows Pulev to clear his head. It's as if AJ idolizes Vladimir Klitschko, who allowed AJ to get off the canvas and clear his head. A bit too much. Right, I'm just telling you, having lived through the George Foreman era, there is no way, I mean, I mean, there is no way that, you know, Pulev in that condition would have lasted the number of rounds that he does after he gets off the canvas. In other words, AJ is cautious. Well, folks, don't you have a momentum problem here? AJ, cautious starter. Then you have Nganu, who might be a quicker starter. It's a 10-round fight. What happens if Nganu gets out the gate fast? What happens if, in a fight where if you win five rounds and nobody gets knocked down, that should be a draw, right? 5-5. Five, five. Right? What happens if Nganu's up three rounds to one at the end of four rounds? Right? You tell me. Understand, too. If AJ is cautious, then decides to step on the gas, folks, he's not fighting a spring chicken. He's fighting a guy who MMA people believe is the hardest puncher in professional sports. Let's say AJ gets knocked down. What I want is for people to think about how AJ handles being knocked down. Right? Hey, the best fighters get knocked down. Right? You heard me mention George Foreman. George Foreman got knocked down by Ron Lyle. And he was hurt. Right? Look at the film. You see Foreman on the canvas. When he starts to get off the canvas, you're surprised. Because <laughs> he, looks, he looks that badly hurt. You're surprised he beats the count. Right, you remember Tyson Fury on the canvas that first Deontay Wilder fight. Fury in interviews talks about how he wakes up in the middle of the count. And even then, he gets up at what, the count of nine? Right, all I can say is, AJ goes down against Klitschko when he got up. Be real with yourself. And I know AJ has a loyal fan base. He is the box office king of the heavyweight division. But let's be honest with ourselves. When he gets off the canvas against Vladimir Klitschko, didn't you think the fight was over? Right? When AJ got off the canvas, what kind of shape was he in? The Andy Ruiz fight's even more interesting. Right, AJ, there again, heavyweight champ. He knocks down Andy. Then he gets knocked down. Right, folks? More important than AJ getting knocked down, because I do believe anybody can get knocked down, is the degree to which AJ got demoralized. Right, understand. A different personality would have thought to himself, hey, okay, Andy knocked me down, but I knocked Andy down. And he's still going to have to come get this title. Right? Even in terms of knockdowns. It's 1-1. Right? Folks, AJ gets knocked down again. You might recall the referee talking to AJ. The referee saying, come to me. Understand what's at risk in that fight. It's the heavyweight title. Right? The ref says, walk to me. You look at the film. You figure it out. It's either come to me or walk to me. And you look at AJ's response. Let's just say there are many men with the title who are thinking, man, I fought too long. I fought too hard to get this title. The ref says, walk to me. The guy might try to walk so fast he staggers. Because he understands, hey, the ref could end this. AJ is lackadaisical. He's so discouraged in a fight where a different fighter would say, wow, my title's really at risk now, right? And he's knocked me down multiple times. 
right, in that fight where your title hangs in the balance, where numerous fighters try to BS refs, right? The ref says, walk to me. The guy can barely see. Joe Fraser is blind in one eye, for crying out loud. And he's out there trying to convince people that he's able to see things in the uh, Thriller in Manila, right? Just, just understand, AJ, so lackadaisical, put the title in such risk, that you understood in that moment that AJ sometimes gets demoralized during fights. Let's talk about a non-knockdown. 12th round, Usyk, first fight. A minute is left. Usyk is fighting in the UK. He's fighting the heavyweight divisions. Box office king in Joshua's backyard. Last minute of the fight, everyone there had to feel that there was a possibility that Usyk was winning the fight. So Usyk steps on the gas. He's not running. This isn't Pernell Whitaker waving at Julio Cesar Chavez. No, no, no. This is Usyk saying, okay, look, if there's any doubt on who has won this fight, I'm going to end that doubt right now. He pummels Joshua for the last minute. Pummels him. Right? Joshua tries to fire back. You realize that when Joshua is tired, Joshua has a problem answering the call in moments like that. Right? By the end of that round, Joshua even blows out of his mouth. Look at the film. Right? Joshua understands he's just survived a storm cloud here. That's, of course, until the judges give their decision. Now, the problem I have here is it's a David versus Goliath situation. Right? I... I believe Wilt Chamberlain was 100% right. No one roots for Goliath. We respect Goliath. But no one roots for Goliath. Right? Had Kansas City lost that Super Bowl, I'm telling you a lot of people would have been thrilled, not just in San Francisco. We don't want to see too much success. I know that sounds ridiculous. In L.A., they have LeBron James who's doing ridiculous things for a 39-year-old, right? He's averaging over 25 points a game. <laughs> I mean, he's, <laughs> he's not only the oldest guy in the league, folks. He's the oldest guy in the league who's the best player on his team. And you still have Laker fans out there who don't like LeBron, right? There's even conversation about whether LeBron deserves a statue outside where the Lakers play, right? These folks somehow feel that LeBron is trying to take Kobe's place, right? That LeBron doesn't deserve the accolades of a Magic or a Kareem or a Shaquille, right? Lakers have too many names to mention in one video, a Jerry, an Elgin, a Wilt, right? LeBron went to 10 finals in a row. After a while, people start to boo Goliath, right? Anthony Joshua, I know if you're in boxing, you view this as a great comeback story. You understand Joshua's a blessed puncher. You understand Joshua only has to be right once against whoever he's facing. You understand that whatever said about Joshua, he got off the canvas against Klitschko, didn't he? He got off the canvas against Andy Ruiz, didn't he? Right? You understand, this guy, at the end of the day, even when he's outgunned, as he was in that first Usyk fight, I'm surprised still the second fight went the distance. Even when Joshua's outgunned, Joshua is there trying to survive the storm. But folks, here... He's fighting Cinderella. Right here, 
He's Goliath. If Joshua comes out and wins three of the first four rounds, nobody's going to be that surprised. Right? You're going to say, well, Joshua is the professional fighter. You know, if Nganu wins three of the first four rounds, think about your own household. Right? Your partner says, hey, uh, come to the kitchen, help me out. You can say, no, nah, no, nah, hey, babe, I've got to see this. Hey, hon, history's in the making. Right? The fire truck could be pulling up in your driveway. There could be smoke everywhere. As long as the electricity is still going to the TV and the TV hasn't melted, you're going to be there saying, hey, hey, hold on, I need to see this. And some of the firemen might have to carry you out of your crib. Right? So I just need for people to understand. Here, you have two punchers. You have one who's a slow starter. Understand, if Nganu gets off to the start that he got off, two against Tyson Fury, you're going to have a different level of buzz. The Fury fight, you thought every round. Well, wow, you know, Nganu's doing better than I thought early in the fight. You didn't think he had a real shot of winning. Even with the knockdown, you thought, okay, now Fury's going to take this seriously. Right? Well, understand here, it's a little bit different. You have some esteemed members of the boxing community who feel that Nganu beat Fury. Right? Understand, even those judges who would rubber stamp rounds the first time around, now view Nganu as a real threat. Let me just close by saying a few other things. Right? You know, AJ does well when a fighter tries to stay away from him. Right? When AJ is able to extend his arms... When he's fighting a Joe Parker who actually wanted to fight inside and the ref wouldn't allow Parker to fight inside and AJ got an opportunity to extend his arms like Lennox Lewis, right? Um, Lewis liked to extend his arms a bit. Joshua does really well, right? Understand in this fight, he has a fighter who is what I call a hoverer. Right? And Ganu doesn't run away from you. And Ganu doesn't really have that great a back foot. No, he's hovering. But he's not right in front of you to get hit. He's not charging into the pocket like Pervetkin did. No, this is the guy who is an arm's length away. He stays at mid-range. Folks, he's going to force AJ, who's cautious, to open up. Now, that could be good for AJ because AJ is offensively blessed. He is a blessed puncher with both hands. But it could also be bad for AJ, depending on Nganu's countering skills. And we really don't have the answer to how good a counterer Nganu is. To sum up, I expect AJ to win the fight by stoppage. Here's how I'm playing it. I like the over five and a half rounds at a minus 117. Right, folks? Otto Wallen just made it into the fifth round. Right? And Wallen doesn't have the firepower that Francis Ngannou does, the one-punch knockout ability, right? Five and a half means the midway point of the sixth round. Robert Hellenius made it into the seventh round. I believe against Francis Ngannou, a cautious fighter is going to spend at least the first two rounds looking at him, figuring out the angles of his punches, mindful of the fact that Nganu likely has one-punch KO capability, right? Understand, too, a cautious fighter is going to spend a couple of rounds getting the lay of the land of Nganu as a righty. Then if Nganu switches to lefty, 
that might add another round to the observer stance that I believe AJ is going to have, right? If AJ starts throwing jabs, understand, if Ngannou goes southpaw, that might neutralize the jab somewhat. So I like the over five and a half rounds at a minus 117. I do think the hedge is very necessary here. And that's Ngannou simply to win at a plus 355. Right? Understand, the way the bet's structured, if Ngannou lands and stops Joshua early, you're okay because you got the plus 355. Right? That'll cover any losses on the over five and a half rounds. If Joshua gets the stoppage, I need for you to understand the risk involved. If it's before the midway point of the sixth round, you lose it all. Once you get past the midway point of the sixth round, you can exhale a bit. Whoever wins the fight, you've at least won that side of the bat. That's how I'm playing it. Let me hear how you're playing it. Tell us about it in the comment section of this YouTube video. Right? Let me also point out too. The over-under for the Dominic Brazil fight was three and a half rounds. Folks, that fight went over the three and a half rounds. My point to you is, why is it that gamblers who are a little bit more reality-based than sports writers, right? Because money's involved. Why is it that gamblers have the over-under here at five and a half? Higher than for the Dominique Brazil fight. It's because we all sense that there's more risk involved here for Anthony Joshua, right? And Ganu might be a ringer. Anything could happen here, right? I think Joshua eventually is just going to be too experienced, too savvy, too much of an explosive puncher. Let's just say I've heard the statements about Nganu being a great puncher from MMA people. I know, I know Joshua's a great puncher. I don't have to speculate about that. Let me just say this too. When Joshua knocks down Klitschko, he knocks down Klitschko first in that fight against Klitschko. Klitschko gets off the canvas. Joshua has credibility for his title reign right in front of him. He has a hurt Vladimir Klitschko. The punch Joshua tries to end the show on, that Klitschko is able to somehow avoid, and it's a miracle he does, is Joshua's left hook. Joshua has an excellent left hook, right? If Nganu is able to neutralize Joshua's jab, Joshua has the option of converting that jab into a left hook, right? I know Joshua has the punches. With Nganu, I saw him knock down Tyson Fury off a left hook. I know Nganu has his own left hook. But I'm just not sure if a 37-year-old who's new to boxing is going to be able to put his punches together as well as Anthony Joshua can in certain moments. Right? The Andy Ruiz fight, think about the shots he hits Ruiz with before he knocks down Andy. That combination was fluid, folks. That's Joshua at his best. Right? If Joshua's at his best, I believe he gets the stoppage. I just want it to be after the midway point of the sixth round. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I look forward to your thoughts. Tell us where I'm wrong on either fighter. Right? I especially want to hear from the Nganu people. What should we expect? I admit, the first fight, when he shifted to southpaw, that was stunning. 
right? There's another moment, too, where Tyson Fury tries to come inside and Ngannou just looks like a brick wall, right? You understood Fury could not just manhandle Francis Ngannou, right? I don't expect Joshua to try to, you know, grab Ngannou and move him around because he's going to find out he's with a brick wall. Right? If you believe in Ganu, plus 355, wins this fight, make the case in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.